Hello, and welcome to Mastermind Sessions. My name is Dante Williams, and I'll be your host this afternoon. Today's topic is going to be up for sale, combating human trafficking. When you think about human trafficking, it's so-called the now modern day slavery, and it involves the use of force, fraud, coercion to obtain some type of labor or some type of commercial sex act. It's a shame that we still live in a world that's like that today, but we'll discuss the role that healthcare systems and how, the role that they can play in combating human trafficking, as well as what we can do as the people to combat this evil that is uh, uh, inflicting uh, evil on our country and across the world. The last thing I wanna leave with you is that until all of us are free, none of us are free. Let me go ahead and introduce our distinguished panelists today. All right, for I thank you so much panelists for being with me, but I wanna just go ahead and introduce you now. We have a young lady who's been with us 20 years, has 20 years of experience in marketing, strategic planning, sales in global uh, in, uh, corporate environments. Her passion is to help others tell their story, not her story, but other stories. She currently serves as a senior manager of alumni relations for Chamberlain University, where she connects and enables 80,000 alumni to work with their professional or have the professional resources needed to change care, healthcare worldwide and in their communities. Through her volunteer efforts, she shares, she shares works and sheds light in issues affecting underserved communities, including human trafficking, economic empowerment, political awareness, and of course, gender equality. Please welcome Ms. Aisha Barnes. Thank you for joining us, Aisha. Thank you for having me. Good morning or good afternoon. Our next distinguished gal uh, uh, panelist is going to be a founder and CEO of Social Butterfly Foundations. She's the owner of Roberts Tab and Associates LLC and also works in human trafficking and gender responsive LGBTQ specialist for Cook County Juvenile Court. She has created and implemented programs and mentored young ladies and has been instrumental in bringing awareness to juvenile probation departments around gender responsive issues, especially, especially in human trafficking. In addition, she has developed and implemented mandatory trainings to identify domestic sex trafficking victims. As the first human traffic gender responsive LGBTQ specialist cook for Cook County Juvenile Court, she has worked alongside several government agencies and helped instrument or develop the human trafficking housing pilot. She is also a critical acclaim author with books of Girls in the City, a status report to teen girls residing in Chicago 2018. She also has issued a published letter of reflection to a little girl, a young woman that once were. And last but not least, whose little girl am I in 2018? Please welcome Dr. Keisha Tab Roberts. Keisha T. Roberts Tab, please. Thank you for joining Dr. Roberts. Thank you for having me, sir. All right. And then last but not least, we can't leave the last panelists off. This lady has brought over 40 years of experience in academic and leadership that she can bring to this discussion. She is a retired former president for Chamberlain University, Paraland, Texas campus. She, prior to working there, she was a College of Nursing Dean for the Houston Baptist University. And she was the Director of Nursing Excellence where she managed and improved quality improvement for Memorial Hermann Southwest Hospital. She is a member of the American Nurses Association and Texas Nursing Association District 9. And she has also given, been given the great honor of being appointed to the State Health Coordinating Council by Texas, by Texas Governor Abbott. She currently serves on the council and its Workforce uh, Development Committee as well. She has recognized, uh, I also want to state that she has been recognized as one of the top most influential women in Houston, Texas in 2018. She also uh, received her Margaret Newman Outstanding Alumni Award from the Houston Baptist University in 2018. And a Memorial Hermann Southwest Hospital, she received her Nursing Leadership Award as well. So please help me welcome Dr. Nancy. Thank you so much, Don. It's a pleasure to be here today. Well, thank you so much. Well, ladies, thank you so much for joining us. This is really a major topic that needs to be discussed. Uh, I know that this is going to be an uncomfortable discussion, but it needs to be had because we have young ladies and men who are out there who are in this 
this human trafficking situation that we're a part of, and we can be that voice for them. So I'm going to go ahead and dive into some questions, if you don't mind. Dr. Nancy, can I start with you first? Are sure. smuggling and human trafficking the same thing? And if they're not, can you shed a little bit of light on the difference between the two, please? Sure, Dante. I think that's a great question. Uh, we often think of smuggling as transporting humans across borders, either state borders, city borders, national borders, uh, and human trafficking may be involved, but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes it's just smuggling. Uh, I think of a smuggling situation such as maybe parents are divorced and one parent takes the children away from the other parent without having the authority to do so. Uh, and that's not human trafficking. But human trafficking, as you okay, mentioned sure. earlier, really involves a coercion and force and involves those humans in commercial sex or labor. And so it may involve transporting them across borders, but it doesn't have to. Okay. You know what? Uh, thank you for so much for sharing that with us and giving us a difference of what that is. Dr. Dr. Roberts Tab, would you like to exp expand on that and share a little of your knowledge with that as well, please? So, yes, one of the biggest myths around human trafficking is that um, domestic trafficking victims are you trafficking that happens domestically is usually done so because someone has been brought over to the United States. And my research has shown that the majority of in individuals that's trafficked here in the United States are domestically born um, and they are involved in some form of tra sex trafficking, rather that be pornography, um, stripping and uh, exotic dancing. Um, any form of commercial sex trade. It's also very important to recognize that commercial sex trade is not is not something that um, is mandatory where a monetary exchange happens. A lot of times people feel like a person is not being trafficked if they have not received a monetary amount. And it's very important that we understand that commercial sex trade and um, domestic trafficking, anything of value that is given to a person in exchange for a sexual act is still trafficking. It is still commercial sex. So rather that is housing, shelter, food, um, gang membership, all of those things encompass sex trafficking. And also when we talk about the difference between labor and um, sex trafficking is often important because we miss how they intersect. And um, sex and labor usually intersect in three different areas, which is massage parlors, um, exotic dancing clubs and strip clubs, and um, also in pornography. And so it's very important to understand that anybody that's engaged in any of those activities that's under the age of 18, they cannot consent to sell sex in any form. And so they will still be considered a trafficking victim under the laws of the United States. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Dr. Tab Roberts. Aisha, would you like to expand on that, especially in the area when it comes to the common myths? Because I think that that's a a misconception of what people think sex trafficking or human trafficking it is. Can, can you share a little light on that with us as well? Right. Um, Dr. Roberts Tab, she touched on one of the biggest myths that people are um, born in another country. Um, but as she mentioned, there are so many domestic victims and a lot of people think that maybe they're um, of a poor socioeconomic background. Um, the fact is that human trafficking victims can be any age, any race, gender, or nationality, um, and come from any socioeconomic group. Um, so we, it's good for us to understand that what conditions kind of led to that situation for them to become a victim, and not just assume that you have to be a part of these certain groups. Now, there are higher instances in other groups, um, such as African-American girls and Native Americans. Um, but let's understand that this is a problem for everyone in every community, for every race and every gender. Um, another thing is that only women and girls can be victims. And you mentioned this earlier too, Dante. Um, there's one study that estimates that as many as half of the victims and survivors are male. Um, that percentage could be even higher, but oftentimes as we know with many things, Male victims don't necessarily come forward and say, you know, I've been a, a sex trafficking victim, right? Um, and LGBTQ boys and young men mm -hmm. um, are particularly vulnerable to trafficking. So um, those are some of the top myths that I think. So let's not just assume that it's one particular group and that's just let's not assume that it's one particular gender. Um, it's something that's happening in communities um, across the country and across the world. You know, Aisha, I just want to thank you for sharing that with us because I, I think you, you're hitting right on the nail. 
we, we think that this is just women and girls, but there are young men and boys who are also being human uh, trafficked as well. And, and I think that sheds light to it. So thank you for sharing those and just and telling us the difference between those myths. Dr. Nancy Ewell, I have another question for you. And, and I think the viewers want to know this as well. How can we identify who the human traffickers are? I mean, is there a picture that they see? Do they wear black and white stripes or do they have a mask over their face? How do we identify these traffickers? Well, traffickers can be anybody. And very often it's family members, peers, friends, people we know, uh, people that the victims know. It might be gang members. Um, some of this is certainly involves organized crime. Uh, it's owners of businesses. It might be employers. So it can be anybody. I've seen um, reports of it being soccer mom, the head cheerleader in a high school. So I think we need to be mindful that traffickers are all around us. Uh, and we may not recognize exactly who they are, but we began to study the behaviors of what's going on around us to get a picture of what's happening. Uh, some examples, I'd refer people uh, particularly to uh, Texas Attorney General's website. There's a great video called Be the One, and it's about preventing human trafficking. And one story in that picture that really just struck home with me is um, presented about up in the woodlands, which is a very rich neighborhood uh, north of Houston around Intercontinental Airport. And the families there just began to notice that there was one particular house that had a lot of different vehicles coming and going at night. And so they uh, got interested, set up a camera, caught pictures, began to explore, and they reported it to the appropriate authorities. And they shut down a major human trafficking ring um, that was really based out of New York. Oh, wow. So I think it's just being aware of what's going on in your neighborhoods, uh -huh. uh, because don't believe this isn't in our neighborhoods. Um, Houston, particularly any of major cities that have airports, uh, ocean ports or seagoing ports, um, train traffic, buses have a lot of ability to be centers for human trafficking and rural areas do too. Uh, and I think I want to clarify one point. Human trafficking also involves a lot of labor, which may be in the hotel industry, agriculture industry, construction. It's not always about commercial sex, uh, though mm. a lot of it is. And, and Dr. Nancy, I appreciate you sharing that with us as well, because again, we're, we're uncovering these myths. We, we think that it's all about just sex trafficking, but I, I love how you brought to our attention how it could be in hotels, it could be in all different forms of mm -hmm. types of uh, human trafficking. It's the modern day slavery, if I'm, right. I'm hearing that correctly. Uh, that's what I've heard too and read. Um, Texas has now required nurses to have an hour of continuing ed in human trafficking to renew our license. And so as I've received and gone to conferences and done some reading, uh, that's always how it's referred to as human slavery modern day slavery. Oh Lord. Well, Dr. Roberts, Dr. Roberts Tab, this question goes to you and it actually follows up with Dr. Nancy Yule. Would you have an extensive background in law enforcement and, and, and seeing a lot of different things? Can you share with us also to help us paint a picture of who these traffickers might look like and and even though we might not know if they're soccer moms or not, can you can you help us see that picture as well? So again, um she was absolutely correct that it can be anyone, anyone. It's been my experience that I've seen grandparents. Um, mm -hmm. I've had grandmothers that traffic girls. I've had friends. I've had older sisters traffic girls. I've had, um, I've had girls who were trafficked by, um, so by trade, I'm a probation officer. I mean, I have a degree, I'm a specialist, but at the heart of my work is in the probation department and I'll always be a probation officer. So as a probation officer, I have had individuals who were being trafficked by former clients of mine, which would make them 16, 17 years old. Um, and so we have to be clear about this image that we're looking for. There is no image of trafficking. I've had couples, very nice couples, uh, present to be very nice couples and take children in as foster parents. And they were traffickers. 
And so a lot of what we see in um, in media prints and in um, marketing ads to bring awareness, it, it, sometimes I'm always um, a little disturbed of the picture it paints because it paints a picture of this big, bad guy. And so, yeah. I, and it makes us um, look past the older person that we may see, the older nice lady that we may see with a group of girls or someone that's in the salon getting a group of girls hair done or in the nail shop or even in a restaurant, in a diner. And so we got to be clear. And Aisha, I see you because we do outreach. So I see your head. <laughs> and so <laughs> when you are uh, when you have boots on the ground, you can see that what, what we've been told is human trafficking is not always the case. And Dr. Yule, you brought up a good point about labor trafficking as far as hotels and motels. Um, we are we have just completed the mandatory training here in Cook County um, regarding um, lodging facilities, hotels and motels. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can get that legislation extended to Airbnbs, because what we do oh, know wow. is that once we find out that once the traffickers find out that we are up, we know what's going on and we know what hotels they move to a different genre. And so you right. got to always be, you know, one step ahead of the game. And so we're seeing a lot of movement around airbnbs and vacation rentals and things of that nature but when we see individuals in hotels and motels that training is not just geared towards sex trafficking and geared toward the customer it's also geared toward those individuals that work in those mm -hmm. facilities that are not always being paid to be there and so right. it's very you know it's very important not to forget that they are victims as well just because they look as if they are earning a living oftentimes they are not if I could just add to what Dr. Roberts, I mean, and Dr. Yule have added, mm -hmm. that's so true. I think a lot of times these subjects, like these tough subjects, because so we're thinking about right now, we're dealing with race, uh, racial inequality, um, but even human tra trafficking are topics that can be, you know, whitewashed or romanticized. A lot of people look at that movie that came out a few years ago, Taken. Like it had to be, okay, this, this nice young high school girl flew over to France and her father came and saved her from the big bad syndicate. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, no, um, that's not necessary. As she said, it could be the person that's right next to you. And that's something that we often overlook. Um, there are several, obviously, I, I watch a lot of TED Talks. So there are TED Talks on this subject. One in particular, a young lady talked about how um, she had been sexually abused from the age from five to 12 by a family member. Um, and then she went away to a youth summer camp through her church. And the person that trafficked her was her youth pastor. Oh, so wow. I mean, it's someone that you would, you know, think that this would be someone that you can put trust in. Um, but in actuality, no, it's, it's not, it's, that's not the case. It's, it could be anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so just wanted to uh, third that point from <laughs> the other panelists that that's so true and, and, and thank you aisha for sharing and, and again I, i'm so glad we're having an open dialogue on this because this is this is truly opening the eyes to people and our viewers who are watching us today so again thank you so much ladies for sharing this dr tab roberts this question goes to you and i think it leads right from where we thought who identifying human traffickers you know can you can you illustrate to us how how are they groom how is the grooming process involved in sex trafficking? And and once we do that, what can we do to help those victims? Because they are victims. How can we help them exit that trafficking lifestyle? Okay, so first of all, just for those who are not aware, grooming is the process of preparing a person for exploitation. And mm -hmm. so in order to do so, Aisha, you spoke about a youth pastor. Um, we spoke about a lot of different people that uh, a victim would probably trust. Trust is the main goal for grooming, to get them to trust you. And so the process is always the same. They target a victim. They find noticeable vulnerabilities. They find that girl or that boy or that woman that is in need of something, that is um, looking for validation, looking for, uh, that has low self-esteem. And so they pounce onto that. And then the, the second thing is to gain, inf gain information through trust. So if I trust you like my youth pastor and I'm at a I'm at a summer camp and we're probably talking about some things that may have happened to us and some things that we may need or is lacking in that process, you have everything you need. And so not only have you gained the information, you've gathered the, the um you've gained the information, you collected the data, but now you've got this individual to trust you. 
which is what's important. Trust is important when we talk about um, the grooming process. The next thing in the grooming process is to feel a need. So once I've gained the information, I found out what you need. And so I present that need. I come in as the savior. I come in as the person that's going to provide the things that you are lacking. And because you trust me, you believe that I will do so. And once I get you to trust me, then I may start to buy you gifts. I may start to really tell you how much, how valuable you are in my life, how much you need. And especially let's, let's talk, um, Aisha, you brought up a good point about the population that's being trafficked because we know that we know that in African American black communities and brown communities and Native American communities, but when we think about what's going on in those communities, there is a need that has not been met, right? And so right. someone is coming in saying, I'm gonna meet that need. But also in those communities, we have a high rate of parents that may be working. That you, so it's not always monetary. Sometimes it's getting right here. I don't have anybody to tell me that they love me. Mm -hmm. I don't have anybody that validate me. And so the first thing that a trafficker will do is to gain a relationship because trafficking is relational. When you think about the word pimp, professional and manipulating people, once I get your mind and your heart, your body will do anything else. And so that is the grooming process. It's that process of getting a person to, to trust you. It's the process of getting that information you need. It's the process of understanding what the need is so that you can come in and fulfill the need. And once that need is fulfilled, and when we think about drugs, we always associate drugs and trafficking, but love is the greatest drug. And if I have lacked that all my life and someone comes in and say, I'm going to love on you, I'm going to validate you, I'm going to tell you all these things, that is the greatest thing to lose. And so that is how our girls and our boys and our women become so engrossed in this process because they have lacked something. You know what? It's heartbreaking to think that people would would want to pre be a predator against someone and, and their emotions and the need. Mm -hmm. And you would think that people want to do the right thing and help people, not not use them for their own good. But uh, that just that hits me in my heart when I think about that, Dr. Tab Roberts. You know, Dr. Nancy, you, uh, what are your thoughts on that as well, just based on the conversation that we're talking about? Well, I, I think uh, Dr. Tab Roberts has really shared uh, a great idea about what the grooming process is. And I'll just indicate that it often occurs in um, social media. Uh -huh. And so right now we're in a time when kids are at home. Uh, we're not out in our environments looking around for this, but our kids are on social media a lot. Yes, they and are. so it, it's going on that way. Uh, many times the traffickers are the recruiters, really. They're the people that are recruiting and grooming uh, the people to be trafficked. Uh, may hang out around mental health facilities and catch people as they're coming out or going in and begin establishing that relationship, trying to develop trust with people who already have some mental health issues. Uh, they uh, look for people who have experienced traumatic experiences, maybe rape or bullying or some disenfranchisement. And that's why the LGBTQ uh, individuals are so vulnerable. Okay. So um, there's quite a process to this grooming from my understanding, and they're very good at it. Very, very good at it. Wow. Wow. Dr. Nancy. Can I just say one thing? Um, yes, you can. Just to piggyback yes. off the doctor. Um, in my work, I can tell you that nine out of 10 of my young ladies, especially women um, who have told me about how they met their, um, their trafficker or who they consider the person they're in a relationship with, it has been through social media. It has been through a DM. It has been um, someone, the courtship on social media is done so in a way that no one can see it. So no one's thinking anything about a young girl, a 13 year old have, developing a, a relationship that she think is real with someone behind the keys or behind a screen because yeah. no one sees that. But if she was out in public with this guy and he was grooming her in that process, that, then someone may take notice and say, that, that does not look right. What is he doing with that young girl? And so Dr. Yu, I just want to tell you that you have tapped on something that we have really, really forgotten about. In the pandemic, not only are our kids on social media, but they're e-learning. Everything is mm -hmm. online. So you can be exactly. talking to your trafficker all day and no right. one is going to pay anything, no, any attention because you're constantly in front of a computer. Yes. Yeah. Wow. 
Aisha, did you want to share anything on that? Um, just, I mean, so true. I, there's not much more to add except, um, yeah, social media is truly a danger. Um, and the amount of access that people have, just like Dr. Roberts tab said, um, if I'm out or if a young girl is out with a grown overage man, you might be like, well, what is that all about? But behind the keys, behind the keyboard, um, and behind the, uh, mobile phone you don't know who you're talking to um and a lot of people don't necessarily know who their kids are talking to um so that's just something that everyone needs to be vigilant about and it goes back to what we were um saying before there's no face no particular face there's no name um it could come in all forms so that's why everyone has to just be vigilant about you know their circle just start with your family members do you understand what they're doing um your nieces and your nephews and then expand mm -hmm. do you understand what's going on in your community yeah. um because people have to be educated to know what to look out for and if you're not educated on what to look out for then you become more susceptible and I think, uh, Ms. Ms. Barnes, I believe that this is actually this platform and, and our viewers are definitely taking note to that. And it's and it's bringing awareness for they so they can look and see and open, open their eyes to things that they possibly never saw before. So thank you again for sharing that with us. I'm going to extend this next question to you again, uh, Ms. Ms. Barnes, is how does human trafficking affect the communities of color? You know, me being an African-American man, and every time you see on TV, or like you say, the movies, they show the, the young Caucasian white lady, white girl who's kidnapped and her father saves her. But we don't really hear much about what's going on in the, when it comes to the communities of color. Can you share some light on that for us? Right. We don't hear a lot about it. And that's unfortunate because racism and oppression um, are embedded and perpetuated in human trafficking, um, just related to the racial inequalities um, of people in color in, in general. Obviously, we're, we're as a nation, we're grappling with that right now. Um, and this is especially true when it comes to sexual exploitation. Um, so African-Americans and people of color are more vulnerable, which is unfortunate. unfortunate. Um, Black children account for over half of juvenile prostitution arrests more than any other racial group. Um, and then more than half, 62% of confirmed sex trafficking victims are African-American. Um, so as both doctors have talked about, you know, there are some, uh, some traits that, you know, people of color are more likely to experience. So there's this history of sexual and physical abuse, um, community or family instability, um, dislocation, child welfare involvement, as we talked about foster care, um, life as a runaway or homeless youth, disconnected from the educational system and more and more and more. Um, so what's the saying? If America catches a cold, uh, Black America catches pneumonia, right? So all of these factors yeah. um, are things that make them more vulnerable targets of trafficking. And as I mentioned earlier about Native Americans, um, they also have, uh, they've seen that economic consequence of losing their land and their cultural, cultural to, to try to survive. So they do that through um, prostitution. It may seem like the only career option to them, to Native American girls and women, which is horrible. So they also see a higher incidence. Um, and you see people of color, as we talked about the um, prison pipeline, you know, we're often put into prison situations and people of color are often hesitant to reach out because they're like, well, if I go to the police, then, you know, I might be arrested. So um, how can I get out of this situation? Um, as we said, you know, there's not always a face, there's not always an easy way out, but um, this highly, highly affects communities of color. Um, and again, the faces just don't show it. We, we think of this story that we may have seen on the news and I've seen them too, of the woman who was um, grabbed in the target target parking lot, okay, in the suburbs. Yeah. Um, but as I mentioned, um, based on those statistics, um, that's not the majority, unfortunately, of the victims that we see. Aisha, that that, that is powerful in what you're saying. Um, I think to myself, it goes back to what Dr. Tabs Roberts and Dr. Nancy Yule said as well is that they're grooming, the grooming and the mindset of the, the, the person who's being human trafficked. 
uh, that they're afraid. I heard you say that they're afraid to go to law enforcement because they feel mm -hmm. like it's their fault. Am I correct on that? Right. Yes. You feel like, I mean, what, yeah. who can you turn to? And if we talk about the history of African-Americans mm -hmm. and police, <laughs> that, that is not a community that we trust. That is not someone that we run to to say, can you help me out of this situation? Um, so, yes, it is. It, it's just an endless cycle um, that is devastating. Dr. Tab Roberts, can you speak to that as well, how human trafficking, how it affects our communities of color to even I give even a more illustration of that? I think Aisha did a great job. I mean, she is absolutely, she yeah. absolutely laid out the pathways in which we find um, African-American um, women, children, boys as well, um, how we are funneled into the, the land of what I call exploitation because of what um, our current situation, we always find ourselves in situations of poverty, of um, absentee fathers, of um, um, incarcerated parents and things of that nature. And so when we think about individuals, when we know that the majority of trafficking victims are recruited through social service agencies like foster home authoritative care centers and things of that nature it would only make sense that we would populate those places based on the the um the what we've endured in this land but i do want to add a historical piece to that um during my dissertation i studied the perceptions of um trafficking victims and one of the things that was very clear to me is that based on our historical um role as a sexual commodity um not only during the Atlantic slave trade, but how we got here, we were always exploited as black women and used to finance um, slavery through our, the children that we bear from our masters. And so it's very hard to get that image of us as sexual commodities when we talk about black children, it's black, black women, especially black women, but it is very prevalent among brown women, it's very prevalent among um, indigenous um, people, Native Americans, but as black women, our, we have always used, been used physically in order to gain some type of form of a commodity, some type of uh, money. You know, our, we bear, we bore children, and then when we talk about once we were out of what well, we were out of slavery, a little freeish, we also was used in the forefront in order to finance things because if I, if our husbands or we, if we were allowed to be married were not in the home, we had to find a way to raise our children, to provide. We've always been providers. And so even when you think about a landlord asking for sex when you can't pay your rent, not mm -hmm. here's, a, here's an agency you may go to, but if you will do this for me, then I would allow a place for you and your children to be safe. Now, no person in the United States should have to do that. And when we think about how we are exploited in so many ways, we live in food deserts. So when we think about choices, did we have a choice to do these things? How hard does that hit when you're hungry? It looks a lot different when you cannot, your basic needs cannot be met. And so like everything else that has happened in America, when it comes to human trafficking, exploitation and labor trafficking, we are hit harder because our circumstances look a lot different. And it's been a systematic, you know, we've been systematically put on the back burner of this land. So we always are in need. Right. Wow. Wow. Dr. Tab, Tab Roberts, this, this really leads into this next question for us. When, when, you, when you speak about this, when, you, when we think about the effects of human trafficking on, on, on the communities of color, how does the uh, adultification of girls of color continue the exploitations? You, you think of the movies and the videos and music videos. Can, can you share some light on that with us as well? So what happens when it comes to the adultification of not only girls, I, I say girls because I, that's what I work with a lot, but even mm -hmm. with boys, um, when you think about the responsibility of black children in the home, we are seen as growner. We are seen as older than our whites or other counterparts. And so when we become victims, oftentimes our victimization is missed because they don't see us as children. So when we think about how how uh, people perceive children of color, they're strong, 
there we, you know, they, they take care of the house. They do the things that women do. They, they take care of the younger children. They make sure that everybody is provided for. And then when you couple that with the amount of sexual abuse that most of our girls have um, experienced, you know, one in four girls of color have experienced some form of sex abuse um, by someone that they are familiar with. It goes back to what um, Dr. Yu and both Aisha had talked about, being familiar with individuals that exploit you. And so now you have created, and think about even with Aisha bringing up the church, you think about the church being a safe haven, for yes. a black girl, um, for black families. That's where we go. That's where we go to get help. That's where we go with, to pray. That's where we go when we when we feel in distraught, when we need a pick pick me up. But if the if the trafficker is there, who's gonna believe you? And the first thing that said when it comes to black girls, oh, she's fast. So what that does is it chop down, you know, us believing, you know, is she is she believable? Could this have happened to her? We see how she dressed. And if you think about the way we are shaped, I'm going to go real with you. I'm just going to have to say it. We are Let's shaped a lot different than, other, than Let's our Let's counterparts. Keep it real. <laughs> we are shaped a lot different than our counterparts. So, so when, we come into a, when we come into a space, we can have on the same thing that someone else has on, but it looks a lot different. It and does. so oftentimes we're sexualized based on what we wear or how things lay on us because of the way we have, because of our body, you know, our, the way we are shaped. So oftentimes we become the target of sexual abuse, which leads to exploitation. And it's based on a cultural, um, the cultural way in which we are reared, the way we, we are built, the way we, you know, we develop, we develop a lot faster. And so because of those things, it makes it difficult, not that it should, I will not give anybody an excuse but what happens is we miss victimization when it comes to girls of color because we see them as women and not girls. Yeah. Dr. Nancy, you can you expand on some of the things that you, you, you have different communities, you, you have black communities, you have Hispanic communities, white communities. Can you explain on what are some of the things we can do to make sure that this is more has more awareness to it from your from your perspective, please? Yes, I I think um, in general I'll just um, jump off where Dr. Roberts Tab kind of led us, uh, and that we need to be culturally sensitive and realize that some of these women and and even the men don't realize they're being trafficked. Oh. To a certain extent, it may be a part of their culture to do the things they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to share an example just to make that real. Um, I'm going to deal dealt with a student who seemed to have every ability to be successful, but was not being successful. And as we began to uncover the student's story, realized that uh, her family was in another state. She had a husband and children in another state. She was in our area to uh, learn nursing, but she was living with family members. Now that doesn't sound unusual, does it? But as the story evolved, she was being required to be the nanny for the children, do all the housework, cook the wow. meals. And if they didn't like the meals, they'd throw them away and make them cook again. And she had no transportation, no documentation. Uh, she didn't have any access to health care, and she had a chronic health condition that required mm -hmm. medication to keep mm -hmm. it under control. And um, she didn't see this as a trafficking situation, but as she told the story to us, all my red flags went up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we have to do in those situations and in health care uh, in healthcare, I expand a little bit in a in a minute on trauma informed care, but is to gain their trust, let them make decisions. So we worked with her. Uh, she got in contact with her husband. We talked to him together, helped him understand the seriousness of her need for healthcare, and how the situation she was in was not working for her, and got him to agree to bring her back home. Uh, so that she could get the health care she needed there. So in her mind, in his mind, I'm sure they didn't think she was being trafficked, but uh -huh. all of the indications were there. There was coercion. There was some need she had for education, <laughs> housing, food uh, that they were meeting and requiring her to perform labor for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that that's kind of, part of what we have to do is be sensitive to these situations. Let yes. the, the people involved have control in the decision-making. 
uh, use their words instead of our own and be real sensitive to maybe previous trauma they've had. Uh, As uh, Dr. Roberts Tabb and Ms. Barnes have indicated, many of these people have had previous traumatic experiences of some kind. May, they may have PTSD. And so the, the key to trauma-informed care is not to re-traumatize them in the situation. So it's set up a whole environment of trust. Um, in the emergency rooms, we have to set up situations where we can get the person who's doing the trafficking or the controller sort of out of the environment so that we can get an honest assessment from uh, the person that's presenting as the patient. And um, I've even seen where uh, x-rays have been ordered and then they take the person, uh, the patient back to the x-ray. They don't do the x-ray, but it's a way to tell the other controlling individual in the situation, I'm sorry, you can't be an x-ray, we can only take this person. And so it's a way to kind of separate them. Um, we always have to be mindful of our own safety as well, because, you know, phones can be on, uh, conversations can be recorded. So to protect the victim as well as ourselves, we have to be mindful of some safety issues in dealing with them. But um, that trauma-informed care is all about creating an environment that's welcoming. People uh, are familiar with trafficking, what to look for, and begin to understand how to establish trusting relationships with these individuals who do not trust healthcare providers, uh, just like they don't trust police. I've heard one statistic, uh, many of these victims have been to the emergency room or been in um, the presence of healthcare providers nine times before anyone realizes what's going on. So it's an often missed situation. Aisha. Dr. Tabs Roberts, would you like to expand on that in any way? I think she did a great job. I just think the only thing that I would add is that um, one thing that we often forget about in informed trauma care is the empowering the victim. She talked about, you know, allowing them a voice. Um, when you think about individuals that have gone voiceless for so long, um, mm-hmm. it's always um, important to look at every single person from a victim-centered lens and not from this criminal logical, you know, aspect mm-hmm. that they did something wrong. It's always often, you know, how can we help you? What do you need? And we never really ask victims what we need, especially when we're in the helping business. We think we know what they need and giving them the opportunity to be a stakeholder in their own recovery or rescue is always very important. Uh-huh. Yeah, agreed. Um, giving them that voice is super important because if you think about it, they've gone a long time without having a voice. Um, and also, you know, sometimes changing the language around them because um, yes, they are a victim, but they're also a survivor. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's like we can just changing the language around it can also empower them too. Um, When you're a healthcare provider and you're talking to them, it's like, you're a survivor, you can do this, giving them positive reinforcements because those are things that they haven't experienced before. They've experienced traumatic um, things that are, truly affecting them both internally and externally. So if we can do our best in those situations to empower them, um, that helps them understand that there is a way out of those situations. One situation I read, it's important when we ask the question, sort of change our attitude instead of what's wrong with you, the question should be what happened to you. Right. Uh, Never ask why. Never ask why. Never ask why, why it's so accusatory, and it also it also blames. It, mm-hmm. it turns your, your yeah, conversation absolutely. to a blame game. Yes. Again, th- this is so powerful, this 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 topic that we're talking about. I I, I also want to bring it to a level that uh, I was actually talking to my wife about this last night. It's not just the victims. Can we share as far as the people who are being and human trafficking. Can we share also, how does this impact families of of, of those individuals uh, who have been human trafficked? Can we share a little bit on that? Can I get that uh, uh, idea from you, Aisha, on what you think about that? Or uh, just share some information on that? Sure. Um, Families are impacted tremendously, just as the victim is. I mean, if you think about it, they're also going through a traumatic experience. Um, They may not know and understand. Um, And we talked about 
uh, victims who have or survivors who have in, uh, challenges with self-esteem or issues. Um, families may not know that. They may not be aware of that. I mean, I grew up in a household with other siblings um, and I had a sister that struggled with self-esteem issues. Um, she never really talked about it uh, from the outside. She looked just fine. Um, but once you understand that and you can deal with that, then families are in a position to help. But for families, it's a traumatic experience as well. Um, and they may not be educated and understand who to turn to or what to do. Um, so there's an opportunity for them to be empowered and help that victim as well. Cause they may think, oh, well, you know, something's wrong with them or maybe they just ran away from home or it's that issue. But if they can understand and be educated to get truly to the root of the issue, um, mm -hmm. that can help their survivor as well. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Tabs, did you have any, any input on that as well? Um, I just want us to think about um, being a mother of, a, of someone who has been exploited and oh. the blame that you have to place, that you must place on yourself of how did I let this happen to my child? And so, um, um, Dr. Yu, when you talk about trauma-informed care, I would love to see something where the entire family is being treated and mm -hmm. not just the person that we, that has experienced the exploitation. Because once we take a minor, and then think about a child that's being set, a mother that has to be separated from her child so that she can be treated. Oftentimes when we have trafficking victims, they have to be taken out of that environment in order to deal with the issues that led to the exploitation and the trauma that they have in, um, occurred while being um, exploited. And so as a parent, that has to be a very hard pill to swallow that you could not, number one, protect your child. And what did you miss? How did you not know this was going on? And what should you, what you could have done better? And so we, we see a lot of, Aisha, I'm not sure if you see this with, with your work, but I see a lot of blaming of parents. She should have known. Why didn't she do this? Why didn't she do that? But when we think yes. about we got to go back to those um, pathways, when we think about those things that that parent may be um, dealing with, it's not, it's not, you know, crazy that they just did not know, especially when you have other siblings. And so I would love to see something where we are treating that, that entire family, because guess who's going to receive that minor back once they've been treated and once they've received any kind of informed trauma care. And we don't want to send them back into an environment that has been untouched. We want to make sure that we are wrapping that entire family around because they all are going to experience some trauma based on just being around a victim or a survivor. And so I think that, you know, I just always want to make sure that we talk about how we need to address us as a community. It's not just an individual. It's not one victim, a survivor, and then a perpetrator. We are being affected as a community. And until we start addressing them, this from that lens, we'll always be here because we're not treating everyone that's involved because it affects not only, you talked about the community of color, Aisha, it affects everything that we, that we do in our community, our schooling, the educators, the teachers, everybody. So we got to create this holistic approach to inform trauma care that includes the family. Right. Yeah. It's truly mm -hmm. a public health issue. It's that's yeah, not it's an individual yeah. issue because as you talked about it, like you said, it affects education. It affects how we deal with issues throughout our community. So it's truly a public health issue, again, that everyone should be concerned about and working towards solutions for everyone involved. Um, because when you have those types of issues, you can't put like, when there's not one single solution that's gonna magically fix it all. Like you said, it has to be holistic. It has to accompany, it has to be supportive for the survivor, for the family and for the community at large. Mm -hmm. Ladies, first of all, again, I just wanna say thank you. This, this topic does not have the true justice that it deserves because one hour is not enough. It's not enough to talk about what's going on in all the communities and how we can make an impact. It's truly touched me. Uh, and I know that it's touched other, some of our viewers. Matter of, quite, matter of fact, I have a question from a couple of viewers here, if you don't mind if I ask this. I have one viewer, his name is Justin. He says, what can a black man do to have a positive impact on our community against the ob uh, objectification of our women? Can anyone share anything on that for me? Yeah, I was just answering him in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and erase that, Justin, because <laughs> I was answering that question in the chat. I think the, the most important thing that a black man can do in order to um, end this objectification of women is to display positive interaction with other black women. 
We have to we have to model a behavior that we want to see. And until we start to model interacting with women as their protectors, and, um, you know, not always um, offering them a voice, allowing them to understand that they are important, you know, and and I, this is not the most popular view, but we also have to model positive relationships um, in front right. of our children because yes. in the black community, we don't all, often see positive relationships between men and women. And so we must model those relationships because it is those negative relationships that get our girls and our boys involved in exploitation, involved with a person that does not have their best interest at heart. And the third thing that I would like to say is that we have to start treating each other like human beings, not competition, not um, not a hashtag, but a human being. The same thing that we would want to be done to us, we do to others. If we if we want validation, then we validate. And so I think yeah. that as black men, I would love to see black men start to just show how how they can um, show love in a way that is positive. And as women, we have to be able to receive that from men too, because if we constantly knocking down everything positive that's being said, we have to change the narrative around what black men look like and what they're capable of. Because once girls see, and even boys, we often lose, we, we lose the fact that most perpetrators come from homes in which violence have existed. And so yes. That behavior, if we model this positive behavior around children, we'll hit it from both spectrums. Wow. I'll just add wow. one quick thing that one thing that I would also like to see from black males. I think um, in addition to modeling the behavior, also um, calling out the behavior when you see it within your peer group or your groups that's negative. Damn. Um, I think a lot of times, <laughs> you know, as within our culture, we'll be like, oh, I don't want to get involved in that or that's not my business. But if you see something that is objectifying to women and girls or not appropriate or is contributing to this negative culture and objectification that we're talking about, then call it out. We, our expectation now with the conversation we're having about racism is that call people out, put them, you know, put them on blast or what have you. So I think we should do the same thing. It's, it's modeling the behavior, but also if, if there's something with that you see that is not right, then also say, Hey, you know, that's not the way that we should be doing things and educate people um, on what is appropriate behavior and also how they can model behavior and not in a negative way. Um, to me, that's all love. You're teaching somebody positive behavior. So it's not a negative reaction. It's positive to say, hey, we can do better. Um, and that's that's what I would add. <laughs> that's key, Aisha. I think that is very key. Accountability. Yes. Accountability within our community. You have hit it on the head. Ladies, I had one more question from one of our viewers, and I wanted to definitely get that up to him before we, we come to a close. Uh, the viewer wanted to know how does social media play a role? And I believe, Dr. Nancy Yule, you spoke to that. But more than anything, if you can help us with this, Dr. Nancy Yule, what can social media do to help with the problem? We see why they can be the problem, but what can they do to help with the problem? I, I think just... Um what I'd like to see is social media platforms actually have some education on the grooming process so that the, the young people that are on their devices and in the social media world have just like ads pop up, you know, hey, uh -huh. buy this from me today. Uh, but there's some information that actually educates them in an age appropriate way about the grooming process and uh, gives them some sense of maybe this isn't right and the questions they should ask. I, I think that would be helpful. Others? Thank you so much. Aisha, uh, do you have any, Ms. Barnes, do you have any anything you want to add to that or Dr. Dr. Roberts before we come to our final remarks or final closing statements? I would just All add right. that in, camp in campaigns and social media campaigns, mm -hmm have realistic um, views of what victimization look like. Because oftentimes we see a young person, um, not of color with a trafficker of color. And so we've created this narrative around what we think victimization look like. And oftentimes women, children and boys of color, they are missed because they don't look like what we have put out as the victim. And so um, I agree with Dr. Yule that that would be great to have those awareness campaigns, but make sure that it is, it is an honest campaign and it speaks to what victims actually look like. And traffickers. 
Yeah. And trafficking. Yeah. I love True it. True representation is important. Yes. I love it. Well, we're getting ready to come to our close. I do want to give you, thank you so much for being a panelist. I know we couldn't get everything in here and it doesn't do it justice. I would love for you ladies to come back and join us again. We could do human trafficking too the discussion. So I look forward to that. So get your tickets now. <laughs> I also would like to give you all, if you can, uh, time is short, if you could just give me a one minute closing remark that you want to, that everyone, you want everyone to leave with. Dr. Nancy, you, can you go first with that, please? Well, I'm going to take off on the title of the video is Be the One. I would just encourage everyone to be vigilant. Uh, if you see any, nail parlors being open late at night or massage parlors and only men going into those institutions be suspicious uh, and educate yourself on the appropriate ways to report uh, the behaviors you're seeing because it is a dangerous world. Uh, as we've said before, organized crime can be involved. So we have to protect ourselves. We don't follow people into these situations, but get the right authorities involved. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Aisha, would you like to share your, your following last thoughts, please? Uh, it's pretty similar to Dr. Yule. Just um, be vigilant, educate yourself. Um, I think a lot of times we feel like we have to know everything. And I, I know I don't know everything. Um, <laughs> I actually was made aware of this issue by an article that um, Gabrielle Union did um, about three years ago in Essence and just talked about that. So from there, you start to build on your education and understand what's going on. So um, you're not going to be able to solve the problem overnight, but understand how you can help contribute to the solution. Um, over half of the states now have resources um, that are available to um, trafficking survivors um, and healthcare institutions as well. Um, so become familiar with those. If it, uh, it's applicable to your state, Dr. Yule, I know earlier she mentioned that um, Texas, they have some good videos and resources, mm -hmm. but familiarize yourself on what is available to you in your states and then as I said, help people within your circle. I just start with my circle. Um, mentor programs that I'm a part with, educate a part of educating them, um, providing information that I can, and then you just build from there. So don't just tackle it a little bit and then build from there. Love it. And Dr. Roberts Tab, we're gonna let you finish and close it for us with your statement and it will close. So I here. agree with both of them about um, you know, being vigilant and the best way to do so is to understand where you can go for help. And so if you can out, I'm always um, very big about giving information. So texting um 233733, that is the deep, that's the human trafficking hotline call. I always um, advise Dr. You talked about being safe. I always advise that you text because you don't want to put yourself in danger that someone's overhearing you telling on you. So it's always easier to text and you can text um, info or help to be free, 233-733. But my final words um, is to always understand the need for collaboration when we're talking about tackling this issue. This is not an issue for law enforcement, for education, for healthcare, but school, it's an issue for everyone. And so the only way that we can successfully put a dent into what's going on with the exploitation of women and children is to be collaborative in our work. We cannot all have these silos where we're never talking to each other because when that happens, all it does is allow victims to slip through the cracks. And so that's very important to me. Also, when being vigilant in your work, to make sure that you understand that every victim do not understand victimization. Most people that's involved in trafficking do not see themselves as trafficking victims. So they won't always run to you for help. And if you offer help, they may be a little, you know, I don't know you. Like, you know, I don't know you like that. And, you know, you all in my business. And so it's important that we continue to do this work even when it's not wanted, when it's unwanted, when, when they're not, when it doesn't feel good, when no one's running up to us saying, help me, I need to get out of this situation. But understanding the signs of trafficking and knowing where to you know, where to get that information and where to report that information can put a great dent as long as we're working together. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts Tab. We're coming to a close now. I just wanna say thank you everyone for joining us on Mastermind Sessions. Uh, this has been a topic that is dear to me and I hope it's dear to you and I hope it's opening your eyes to see things different. 
Next week, we'll have mastermind sessions where the topic will be telemedicine. So please stay tuned. One o'clock, one o'clock Central Time, Central, Central Standard Time. I also want to let everyone know, please be safe. We love you. Take care and thank you.